I'd like to introduce Right Worshipful Brother Jacob Thompson, who is the Grand Historian of the Grand Lodge of Missouri, AF and AM. Brother Jacob is a 32nd degree Knights Commander of the Court of Honor, KCCH, in the Valley of St. Louis, Ancient Acceptance Scottish Rite, Southern Jurisdiction, where he is the Director of Education. His mother lodge is Silex, sorry if I say that wrong, Silex Lodge. Perfect. Number 75, uh, that's AF and AM in Silex, Missouri. Uh, so, Brother Right Worshipful Thompson, go ahead and uh, take it away. Awesome. Thank you, Brother Kraft. It's an honor and pleasure to speak and join you tonight, brethren. Uh, I had the opportunity several years ago, uh, sadly not to meet any of you, but I was in the memorial uh, and did get to see your guys' lodge room and, and uh, home there. I was very impressed. Uh, and I look forward to someday being able to make it back to D.C. Uh, I spent a couple of days there for a conference several years ago uh, and sat with a, uh, a lodge in D.C., uh, for their meeting. Uh, I, it's a story for another day, but suffice to say, I don't speak any Spanish, and the lodge that I showed up to only worked in Spanish, uh, and they were very welcoming. Uh, it was a great time. They even told me, you know, if I just wanted to leave, I could do that, uh, but that was my last uh, real experience in your guys' neck of the woods. Um, before I kind of go any deeper, I, I do want to reiterate what was just said. Uh, this is toned towards the Master Mason degree, I'll, I'll hit on that in a minute. Uh, there's no secrets that are going to be revealed. Everything I'm going to cover, uh, you can find in very easy, very easily acquirable text. Now, I may go on some different tangents, and I may suggest directions for you to contemplate and meditate upon, but there's nothing going to be revealed here, at least within the bounds of general secrecy, uh, that cannot be found in Pike's Esoterica, Mackey's uh, works, various works, uh, or other recent iterations of text by various scholars. To, doesn't matter who you want to pick up. If they touched on this degree, we've hinted in it in a way. Um, as was pointed out, I am the Grand Historian for the Grand Lodge of Missouri. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege to serve our Grand Lodge this year. Uh, we're just coming out, basically, in the next month, we'll end our 200th anniversary. Uh, we began in 1821 with three lodges that have been around for sometime before that. Um, so we've had a lot of things going on here, um, and I've had a great opportunity to be involved with that. In more particular, though, uh, I am involved heavily with our Scottish Rite here in St. Louis in our valley, uh, and I serve as our director of education uh, with some other projects and things like that. And, and that's part of where this presentation came from tonight. Um, tonight's presentation is the ELU, the Ruffians, and the Master, uh, Principles and Purpose. Uh, and this came out of several discussions, and we'll get to the slides in a minute, but this came out of discussions I had with brothers in the craft lodge, in my home lodge, Silex, uh, which is a lodge of, of about 30 guys. That's our entire roster. Um, it, it came up in a couple other lodges I visited as a, as a district deputy grandmaster, and we started talking more about this degree and the beauty of the Master Mason degree and the symbols that occur in it. And then I remember having a conversation with a brother after he had joined the Scottish Rite. Uh, he had come down to the Valley of St. Louis and took the work. And after he finished the Lodge of Perfection, he, he came up to me and he said, wow, you know. And he went on a, a solid 30-minute tirade about all these new things he had just realized. And so we began to talk about it. And, and as time went on, uh, it kind of led to some of the directions and things we'll talk about here. Uh, additionally, a lot of this you can find in various other ways hit upon. So our discussion today is going to hit upon these three components, the ELU, the ruffians, and the master, how they integrate, how they work together, and, and what symbolism we can find in them uh, through the craft lodge that, that is maybe even brought more into fruition through other bodies. We're not going to spill any secrets either way in, in anything that you wouldn't already be able to easily find ready, readily at your hands as a master mason now. At this time, uh, I'm going to start sharing slides. So give me just a minute and we will get a slide deck up. I see a screen, it's coming. 
There you, you got go. slides? Yep, I see slides. Awesome. Thank you. So, brothers, our discussion tonight is to focus to an understanding, to meld our understanding of the key symbols that are found in the Master Mason degree through their overarching symbolism their Everybody relationship people, sorry to yeah. interrupt but there's a little my little face is in the top there and uh i don't know if you could if you could close that in the top right hand yeah. corner we might i mean i'm kind of can... ugly so i don't think we want to see me uh, more than we have to yeah we can just change the face and... <laughs> oh now it's Nick. <laughs> see about that there, there we go. go is that better yep it's better awesome uh so anyway we're going to meld these symbols together, we're going to look at their relationships and their motivating purposes as highlighted in the perspectives of the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite, Southern jurisdiction, as well as in our craft lodge ritual. It's worthy, like I said, to note that we're not going to divulge any crazy secrets here uh, or anything like that in, in any scope of measure. One thing I do want to hit on very quickly from a historical uh, standpoint, um, and I suppose uh, being where you gentlemen are and where you brethren are, uh, you have some more exposure to this than perhaps me and my lodges here in the Midwest. Um, there are multiple versions of the allegory in the third degree. The Scottish Rite has one allegory, the Preston Webb system another. This comes from the early evolution of the Master Mason degree, and it's kind of splitting. The Master Mason degree was coming into fruition. It was being developed. And at some point, it made its way across the pond uh, from England into France, where it kind of took a whole other evolutionary route uh, than what happened in England. And that's where we get some of the allegory and some of the meaning uh, that comes through in the Scottish Rite work, but also comes through in our craft lodge. So the first thing I want to talk about and begin our basis with is something that, that we're all very, very familiar with. But perhaps we haven't used this term to describe it uh, or put it into context. And that is the ALU uh, or ELU, depending on where you're at in the United States. You'll hear it both. Uh, I've been told, generally speaking, that in the French sense, it's like René. So ALU. Uh, and that word means elect. And the ALU are the fellow craft. They're the guys who are working in the temple. Uh, but these are very particular fellow crafts. These are the fellow crafts that go out and work in the search uh, for the master, in the search for the assassins. Uh, but these are also the guys who were set apart by Solomon for various other important tasks. And so in the Scottish Rite, we hear about these Elu a lot. They show up in several different degrees. The Elu of the Nine, the Fifteen, the Twelve and then a degree called Perfect Elu. Um, that whole idea of the elect uh, or the Elu isn't just set, though, to those degrees or to just the Scottish Rite. Uh, we see that name appearing in various other rites and other Masonic groups, quasi-Masonic groups, um, and the like. These are the guys who are working. These are the guys who come up to Solomon and say, hey, something's wrong. And then Solomon finds them worthy enough to carry out various tasks later. They are the Elu. They are the elect. And that's what that word means. Now think about that for a minute. These guys, these craftsmen, these workers, and in particular, these workers who are going to be involved in dealing with the Tyrians, dealing with the assass uh, those assassins we're going to speak about later, dealing with the death of the master. These guys are set apart. They're elect. They're Elu. Now, why would they be elect? Well, if we think about it in the grand scope of it, we're considering, of course, this idea that they're set apart. They're set apart to do something different, to progress on a new path. And, and perhaps it's in that sense uh, that we're all Elu. We're all elect. And if you think about that for a minute, consider that these fellow craft are selected by Solomon to fill new roles. And we learn about that in these Scottish Rite degrees, the degrees of the Lodge of Perfection. We see the experiences of what happens after the Master Hiram has been slain and work goes to a standstill. There's arguments, there's fighting, 
There's questions about who will lead the work, who will be the leaders, who will step up to the plate. And so Solomon has to select people. He has to elect people to fill these roles. When we reflect upon that and we consider this important nature that these are men selected from a massive group of workmen and raised up above their their equals to be the first among their equals in various tasks, we have to think for a moment Doesn't that also reference back to other degrees? Aren't we elected in other degrees? As entered apprentice, as fellow crafts, as master masons, if your your jurisdiction allows, you know, proficiency or mentoring work where you're required to have a turn-in of some form, you're elected and selected again for elevation. But all of us begin in that process. We have to put that petition in. It has to be reviewed. You have to be interviewed to your worthiness. Are you worthy? Are you well qualified? Are you deserving of this honor to be set apart as a mason, as an inner apprentice? So this idea that the ELU or the ALU uh, is only limited to those brothers so far up the chain who are now doing very important tasks is perhaps misconstrued. It begins in the inner apprentice degree when we are first set apart, when we are first elected. The word ELU, the concept of the ELU or the ELU principle, this idea of being elected and set apart to a new task, to a new role, is very important in the early degrees of the Scottish Rite. It's very important in our craft lodge experience when we're selected for new roles, given new working tools. And it's important that we remember this and we reflect upon that and we keep in mind that we were elected and selected for a new role, for a new purpose and duty. And keeping that in mind, we move forward. Now, what's interesting about the term ELU uh, in its use within the Scottish Rite is the fact that it is generally attached to what we call the Lodge of Perfection, uh, which includes the 4th through the 14th degrees. Uh, And these degrees, generally speaking, deal with the work that happens around the temple after uh, the slaying of the master. We're still dealing with Hiram, King of Tyre, Higher, uh, King Solomon, um, all these craftsmen are trying to build that temple. And there we're dealing with this idea of being elect, being set apart. We see a, a flashback to that kind of idea in a way later on in the Scottish Rite through the word kadosh, uh, which means separated, set apart, holy, consecrated. And the word kadosh is, is Hebrew. Uh, that comes into play when we move to the very end uh, of the Council of Kadosh uh, in the 30th degree of the Scottish Rite, uh, which really, in a way, was kind of like the foot soldiery type degree, if you will, in terms of what its great symbolism is uh, within the scope of all the degrees there. But it harkens back to that point. You're set apart. You're, you're elected again and set to a new service. So this idea of being elected, being selected, being set apart, um, being dedicated to a new role is very important in masonry. It's kind of core in a way to our our processing, our initiatic experience, because it's elevating you to a new role. In the degree ELU of the nine, uh, for synopsis sake, we discover where one of those Tyrians is hiding. In Elu of the 15, we find out where another two are hiding. In Elu of the 12, we we witness the judgment of these men, and we learn about the importance of of trial by jury, uh, the importance of of good government and the strong executive branch, things like that. And in perfect Elu, you're the perfect elect, you're the perfect mason, set apart with your understanding of that lost word and, and the concepts that that meld to it. But who are the ELU we're specifically talking about today? Again, jumping back, these are the 15 ELU. They're 15 craftsmen who were elevated by King Solomon for some specific duty. And of course, they're later rewarded. Now, now, what do I mean by specific duties and later rewarded? Well, this, this concept of the ELU, as I alluded to earlier, picks up on multiple occasions, and it it relates to these brothers who are taking on new roles. They're filling the void left by the master who's been slain. 
So they're becoming worksite superintendents, administrators of justice. They're becoming legal authorities. They're becoming private secretaries. They're becoming administrators, architects, geometricians, filling the voids and being set apart to these new roles. Of course, additionally, there is the other part of this degree uh, and this system of work where these ALU are also the same brothers who showed up before the king and, and are now charged to capture the Tyrians, the assassins of the master. And they're set apart not only for, you know, the tasks of their job, you know, the craftsman work, but this, this action of uh, justice in seeking those who slain their master. The ruffians, the assassins, the Tyrians, uh, depending upon your jurisdiction and your interpretation of the ritual, all of those words can fit for these three gentlemen uh, who play a key moving part in our work. And while in the Preston Webb work, these men are relegated generally to a fairly short portion of allegory, uh, the Scottish Rite expands upon that and digs a little bit deeper, and we'll we'll kind of meld between them to make some sense of this. From a historical point, it's worth noting that in the earliest versions of the Master Mason degree, the earliest written versions, uh, when we look at like Samuel Pritchard's Masonry Dissected, uh, there are no names given to these Tyrians. Uh, no names are assigned to them, and their weapons that they use in their action are the setting maul, setting tool, and setting beetle, which, if you cross-reference to Mackie uh, or other resources, they'll tell you that's the exact same tool. They're all using a setting maul. Uh, so there's no three separate instruments. There's no name set. It's all very, very vague in 1730. Uh, 30 some odd years later, by the early 1760s, we're now at a common point where the names that we now know, generally speaking, and their implements are well locked in. Um, they're well assigned, at least from the lens of the craft lodge. Uh, from, our, from the Scottish Rite perspective and from the Order of the Royal Secret, which is its predecessor, we find some interesting tidbits that I think are, are definitely worth at least scratching your head just a bit about. The 1783 Franken manuscript tells us that the three Tyrians' names are Jubilum Ericrop, Jubilo Gibbous, and Jubilo Gravelot. Uh, we learn generally from that ritual that uh, Ekrop means assassin. Um, and beyond that, uh, we're told in the liturgy of the, of the Scottish Rite, Porch and Middle Chamber, which deals with the craft degrees, we're told that the Tyrians carry several other variations of their names. Uh, Yebula is called Romvel or Gibbous. Yubulo is Hoven or Gravelot. And, and Yubulum is Abiram, Abibel, and Ericrop. Uh, one thing I would note is, generally speaking, when you're looking at older ritual uh, from a Pike perspective, and we'll talk about it in a bit more detail momentarily, uh, he generally stuck with older spellings. What's interesting to point out here, though, is when Pike talks about Romvel, Gravelock, um, or, or some of these other variations of names, Pike later points out uh, in his book to known as the Book of the Words that some of these names can be linked to uh, certain figures in the English Civil War. Uh, specifically, uh, when you look at like Romvel, Cromwell. Uh, and Gravelot uh, can also be tied, and Hoban can also be tied to uh, several generals and, and leading parliamentarians of the English Civil War. Uh, maybe a bit of a dig by the authors at that time. In either manner, whether we're talking about these names as, as dual names or singular, uh, it's important to reference and keep in mind that these are standalone names, not just a surname. It, it's all one thing. So Jubilum Ericrop, Jubilo Gibbous, Jubilo Gravelot. Um, those are a solid name. It's not just first and a last. There's, there's no concept of the surname there. From the more well-known perspective that comes around in the 1760s to the Preston Webb ritual as it later develops, 
Uh, and as we know it, we often see the names Jubala, Jubalo, and Jubalum. The endings are interesting in that they are A, O, and M, um, or um. um. Worthwhile, those are the masculine, feminine, and neuter endings of Latin nouns. Think about it for a minute. Jubala, Jubalo, Jubalum. They're not anything you would hear in Tyre for a name. They're not Hebrew. Um, Pike himself comments when he's reviewing this topic that the names seem to be the work of men with little invent knowledge, little fertility of invention, less originality, and no genius at all. And he spent some time studying this. Why are the endings, the masculine, feminine, and neuter Latin nouns? What purpose could there be? He had, Pike himself thought he came up with some discoveries, but he couldn't place it in general. And inevitably, he kind of gave up on the pursuit, uh, finding it misguided. When we consider the Latin endings, though, he did come to at least some base conclusions uh, while they fall out of the wrong order. Uh, if we were to put them in the normal grammatic order as used at the time, it would actually be O-A-Um, not A-O-Um. Um, but Pike points out that perhaps we could tie this to a Greek translation, saying that the A um, could be assigned to the Greek uh, in reference to the Greek word for the church being feminine, uh, ecclesia, plus the church is also referenced as feminine in biblical text, the church in general, when we're referencing the Catholic church, the early Christian churches, uh, it's, it's a feminine nature. So Pike says here, maybe there's a connection. Of course, he's pulling in a couple threads that we'll hit on later. The O, uh, putting it in order, of course, as present, presented, uh, could reference the representation of the Roman political machine, as we see the emperor as a man. Not sure I exactly buy into him going there with that. And the um in Latin, uh, he tells us, could potentially relate to the vulgus or the Greek plethros, meaning the multitude, the mob, the rabble, uh, the populace. These interpretations, assigning the letter A towards the idea of the church and ecclesia, the letter O towards man um, and the emperor and government, if you will, and the um towards the mob, is it, something that Pike takes forward uh, in his later interpretations as we talk about the weapons. And we'll We'll come to that in a moment. But you have to scratch your head and say, well, this just doesn't make any sense, at least at face value. Um, and, and I like to present it to brothers as a way to at least get you to scratch your head and think and perhaps see. Now, for the Scottish Rite brother, you may also ponder for a moment on the order we've just hit at. If it's in the correct Latin order, it'd be O A um, not A O um. What significance could be there? What symbolic reference may we find? Well, from the front of the name, Jubal, uh, we see nothing symbolic or significant. Pike himself says this, um, and it's worth noting uh, that, of course, there is no J at that time in the, in the alphabet and, and those types of things. Think Indiana Jones and Jehovah. Uh, but the word, ju the name Jubal would be more, much more like Yubal or Ibal, uh, which means a river or to flow. So if you're thinking about this, to flow, what's flowing? Well, think about what these men did, their actions, their aggressive haste. Things flowed from them. And when we look at these Tyrians, and, and we'll discuss this shortly, we consider their symbolism. What could be flowing out of them and affecting the world? What could be flowing out of them and impacting men of integrity? What do they represent and what are they putting out into the world? Uh, I think that's a very interesting observation, this idea that, that Yubel or Ibel means a river uh, to flow. Um, and when we think about what could be pouring out of these men, when we consider their, their true symbolism, which we haven't really hit on yet, but we will in a moment uh, as we cover these base thoughts. Back to that AO-UM. 
What's interesting within this is that the AO Om when linked together uh, can lead us perhaps towards the concept of the sacred monosyllable of the Hindu and Aryan cultures. Uh, this was something that Albert Pike noted and, and several other scholars have since mentioned, dug through the uh, piles of research on and examined. This led Pike uh, to his own thoughts about the assassins, to his own thoughts about the, the meaning of their names. But what connections did he truly come to? He thought he made a valuable discovery in general by this, yet he realized that there had to be more. There had to be some greater significance to these individuals than just some random link to the sacred monosyllable. So what do these assassins do? What, what links them together? What ties them to such evil? Well, the ruffians of the Scottish Rite and even in our craft lodge are aggressive. Uh, they're a different brood of men, these fellow crafts who are hasty, they're set apart, they're after one thing and one thing alone in their mind, and, and it's worth keeping their aggressive nature in the forefront because very often within the craft lodge experience, we don't give these Tyrians a lot of thought. We, we look at them very simply, we rush through them, and we're done, probably as much in terms of attention as we give the, the 12 craftsmen, those Elu, the Elu, who present themselves to help and aid Solomon. Uh, we don't really weigh them too much in our heads and in our hands to say, what, what really is their worth? Where can they take us as a symbol? Well, the Tyrians and the ancient and accepted writers seem to be representations primarily of ignorance, fanaticism, uh, greed in some, some rituals, uh, but usually ambition. So ignorance, fanaticism, and ambition. And of these vices, each one of these men represents that. So if we think back to that, that connotation of their name, the Ibel, the, the Yubel, that idea of a river flowing out, these men are, are representations of ignorance flowing out into the world, fanaticism flowing out into the world, ambition, intolerance, anger, envy, greed, all flowing out into the world. And each man embodies one of those specific concepts, each assassin. And they're representative of the whole of those vices, the whole of those ideas which ensnare all nations. They fetter a free mind, a free people. And it isn't that they represent those all the time, because we can assign other vices to them if we decide. But it's the idea that they represent those vices, those superfluities which tether men, tether minds, tether countries and people. Their presence and the symbolic sense of them combating against a symbol of integrity, the master, as well as being found, uh, has some profound revelation. But if we consider them as the representation they are, the outpourings of ignorance and fanaticism, ambition flowing out, and then they strike down this representation of, of deep moral virtues, high integrity, a man of virtue, a man of godliness, uh, if you will, a spiritual awareness. What broader significance can we be pulled to? The Tyrians become the vehicle and the conveyance of all the vices, the superfluities of our life, which infect our hearts, minds, and our bodies, and divert us from the path of truly understanding where we go. So as we understand that we are Elu, or Elu, set apart, we're elected, we're set apart and given these lessons in the degrees of masonry. We're given these lessons and instructions on charity, benevolence, practicing virtues, being upstanding, being men of integrity. And then we're having to hunt and fight these assassins, these Tyrians who represent and are flowing out of them all of these vices, all these evils. It's like that Pandora's box that's moving. It's a moving target that we seek to close in a way. How do we address that? How do we move forward? How do we rise up to that level of being the elect, being the set apart? Of course, the second part of this uh, symbolic discussion in regards to the Tyrians would have no place if we didn't consider 
the weapons of their action. Uh, Albert Pike himself, uh, in his early writings, notes that he never really saw anything alluded to in terms of where the, the action occurred, where the blows were, if anything was symbolic, if the action that happened to Hiram was just something that randomly popped up, or if it was meaningful. And in fact, in certain jurisdictions, it's all in one area of the body, even though it may be with all three tools. Yet, Pike worked away, and others have worked away since examining this ritual, the Preston Webb work and others, to see what we can glean. So let's begin briefly uh, with an overview of each of these, these terrible assassins and their weapons. The first weapon and the working tool we would most often see early on in our Masonic career is the 24-inch gauge. We're reminded here of the Greek word for cannon. And the allusion is made to the idea that a, a cannon was a straight rod used for measurement um, by carpenters as, as a rule to ensure their work was square. But it also represents a rule, a regulation of law and conduct. Uh, keep in mind, of course, the, the ecclesiastical law, we're going back to Ecclesia, um, of the Roman Catholic Church, the canon law as some would may be aware, that is the, the current legislative law that they work under is the ecclesiastical law uh, for the Roman Catholic Church. And even then, the power of canon law uh, was quite profound in Pike's time and, and far earlier, even more severe. Yet, we're not talking specifically about the Catholic Church here when we're talking about canon and making this connection. We're making the connection that the 24-inch gauge or, or cannon, uh, uh, connecting the symbol here, is not a symbol specifically of the Roman Catholic Church, but of the church in general, a despotic church, a corrupt religious power, a corrupt priesthood, a corrupt priesthood. And we're told that when the priesthood has not cared to remember that its only functions are to teach and persuade, and it has become arrogant and tolerant, um, luxurious, corrupt, ambitious, cruel, as it has in all countries in all ages before. It has made religion the prolific mother of dissension, persecution, war, murder, extermination of those guilty of cherishing and avowing what is so sought to be heretical views. But always at Rome, at Constantinople, at Geneva, in England, Scotland, and New England, the dominant church has grasped greedily for power and been the intolerant repressor of free opinion. Therefore, the junior warden with a rule of steel symbolic of the vindictive and cruel priesthood smites the candidate on the throat where the organs of speech are. So you think about that. The 24-inch gauge, this, this canon, this representation perhaps of despotic or corrupt religious power strikes you in the organ of speech, that place where we express our free speech, our ability to say our will, our free will, if you will, vocally, um, and express those free thoughts. The second Tyrion, of course, wields the square, and the square is a joining of two canons, which can remind us of the intermingled religious and civil authority. It brings together those two points to make that square, to make that 90-degree angle. And of course, when we look at the symbolism of things like the square and compass in our, on our altar, in our lodge room, we're reminded of the spiritual parts of man overtaking the material. And in the, those combinations of the square and compass, the square is what is attributed to the material world, to the physical plane. So here we have that representation of the material world. We have that representation of the religious and civil authority. And we're reminded that despotism relentlessly crushes all the great and noble, the high and the holy aspirations of the heart. Thus, the senior warden with a sharp angle of the square of steel is symbolic of despotic power, and especially of that represented perhaps by Imperial Rome. And it smites the candidate on the part of the body where the heart, his seat of affection, lies. Of course, the final implement that setting mall as fickle as the wind, cruel as the sea, 
brutal as the horde of uh, the African savages, the mob or populace is aptly symbolized by the setting mall, the fit we weapon of a blind and frenzied brutality. Uh, this comes from Pike's Symbolism of the Blue Degrees. This idea of the setting mall is, is swift. It's heavy. It's brutal. It's instant. It hits us in the seat of thought. We lose that intellect. We're stunned. And reason, we lose our reason, and we're lost to disregard. Thus, the setting mall, the fifth symbol of brute force of the populace, smites us in the seat of our thought and completes the murder. People are easily swayed by the quick weapons of the religious authority, kings and rulers. They're unquestioned in their mob, and they swiftly move. To that point, we see these three Tyrians, these representations of these, these key vices, Fanaticism, ignorance, ambition, um, of course, representing all those other things, intolerance and the, and the like, coming together to strike a man down. First hitting the seat of expression, free speech, then the seat of affection, then the seat of thought, knocking down the man of integrity at each point and reducing him to nothingness. Of course, with, within this context, uh, there are several Masonic scholars who apply a different lens to this, uh, and you can see different allegories. Uh, one of these allegories is the comparison of, uh, of course, the Hiramic legend to the legend of Osiris, as well as to the legend, or not the legend, uh, but to the accounts of the life of Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, and Pike himself, in dis discussing this, talks about some of the mixed symbolism as he cuts through with it. You know, we talk about the canon being the 24-inch gauge, representing uh, despotic religious power. Well, Pike lays this up and he says, well, if you're a Christian, then perhaps you'll look at it as the high priests uh, who gave Christ, uh, the teacher of Nazareth up. When we look at the square, the mixing of, of despotic religion and government, Pike says, okay, then perhaps to the Christian that is Pilate and Herod. Uh, and then, of course, the setting mall uh, is representative of the mob force, that fact that the teacher was offered to the people, you know, will you free him or will you free Barabbas? And, of course, they, they make their choice. Uh, this is one of many, many comparisons uh, to these interactions that are placed before us through various lenses. And this is just kind of one of the easier one to point to. But I draw these comparisons for you to reflect, because at this point, we should reflect deeply on the symbolism of what has occurred. We as Elu are set apart. We're journeying through our degrees. And in the shadows of our degrees lurk the Tyrians, because especially if we look through the lens of the Scottish Rite, the Tyrians actually have escaped. And that's the great difference here that we haven't hit upon. For us in the Preston web work, the Tyrians were captured in the Master Mason degree and dealt with. In the Scottish Rite work, they're unfound and not captured until the ninth and 10th degrees. But what does this symbolism mean then? Why aren't they caught much earlier? From my perspective, I see it very clearly as a lesson in the constant struggles of good and evil, in a lesson of perseverance, in a lesson of sacrifice and purification. Because these Tyrians, they didn't just disappear. They're lurking in the background of each one of the degrees from the fourth to the eighth. They're lurking in every degree because as Elu, we're elected, we're set apart, we're given this proper instruction, but we're men, we're human, we're, we're swayed at times with our own weaknesses and our frailties. And thus, these Tyrians who are flowing forth we're pouring forth ignorance, fanaticism, intolerance, ambition. They're sowing seeds that we as, as Masons have to stand up and push past. If we wish to live up to the, the lessons of the master. The slain master is one of the more interesting topics we could probably discuss and one we could go on to for some extensive period of time. But is he Hiram Abif? Is he Kurum Abi? Is he Hurum? Who is he? This is probably one of the more confusing points that I'll, I'll, I'll cover 
for those who haven't taken a lot of time to really explore the master hiram. The book of Kings tells us that he was a worker in brass only. Uh, from a timeline perspective, the book of Kings in the Bible is older than Chronicles. Um, but of course, we can always hem haw on that. Uh, the book of Chronicles tells us he was more than just a worker in brass. He worked in other metals, iron, stone, wood, fine linens, and he was an engraver. The book of Kings uh, mentions the name uh, Kudim and Kurum. In Chronicles, it's just Kurum. Uh, and of course, in Chronicles, he's also mentioned as Kurum Abi, or Abu, meaning uh, Kurum, my fa his father, or Hiram, son of Hiram in the more literal sense. Uh, of course, there's also some contention that perhaps uh, when we talk about uh, Kuramabi or Kuramabi, uh, it, it's more of a reference to he's a counselor um, it, as of his father. Uh, is, is brought up through several different scholars as they look at this name. What is very important to do is, not, is to realize uh, we're not looking at this in the sense uh, of a, a first name and surname like John Jones. Just keep that in mind. Um, but of course, our Preston Webb work, we know him as Hiram. Um, in older Scottish Rite ritual, you usually will actually see him referred to as the Master Kurum um, or Kurum. Um, but that's normal for the older ritual because Pike himself preferred to use what he called or would probably call the correct names for individuals. Uh, such things as Jerusalem, Yehuda, Yeshua, Kurush, and Darush were used instead of things like Jerusalem, Judea, uh, Jesus, Cyrus, and Darius. Uh, he would use those more traditional names rather than the anglicized variations. But what purpose does the master serve? What purposes can we see perhaps in his, win in his name uh, and in the meaning of what he does? The master is, by Masonic accounts in our allegory and traditions, uh, a working man. He is some type of servant, perhaps even a slave of King Hiram. Yet he's equal to and trusted by both kings. And he's trusted so much that it is death, the vacancy, the void that's there, that's present. Um, it, it takes quite a substantial amount of time to, to fill it and to really address, address the needs of what's been left vacant. From a symbolic perspective, the two kings can be said to represent the wisdom and power of deity. Divine power, divine wisdom. Hiram Abiff would then represent the divine word or the utterance of that divine wisdom, uh, a trinity working in consort. Further, when we look at Hiram's name, uh, from the older versions, and we put it kind of under an analytic perspective, we see that the Hebrew root verb uh, could mean an opening or a hole, an aperture. Uh, in the sense of it being used as a noun, uh, it means an open window or white, a white linen. Uh, and the plural form of, form of his name is, of course, freeborn or nobles. Uh, we can make a couple very interesting observations from this as we look at it. It's an opening. Again, we talked about with the assassins there, you know, a river flowing forth or, or, or something flowing out. But here we have this opening, this window. Uh, we have white, white linen, this idea of purity, uh, the divine perhaps within him. When we talk about the fact that Hiram Abiff could potentially represent the divine word, the utterance of that divine wisdom flowing out that, of that opening. I think there's some unique possibility there. Thus, the master's name may have that symbolic representation of that manifestation of the divine light shining out. Of course, uh, from that lens that early Christian Masons took, uh, they often equated him with symbolizing uh, the teacher of Nazareth. Uh, this is noted by both Mackey, Pike, and, and various other scholars. Um, and of course, they tie this, keeping in mind what we just talked about here, that Hiram could be a representation of the divine light shining out, that utterance of the divine word. Um, there's a way thus we can make a connection to Hiram uh, as perhaps being the Hermes or the master of the lodge, that representation of the word, the logos, uh, we see 
discussed in the Gospel of John, uh, which in one way or another, I'm sure most of us are aware of. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, and, and there's some interesting connotation to that, this idea that Solomon, Hiram, and Hiram formed this trinity, this divine link of the divine wisdom, the Word, uh, as it works forward in its interlocking nature. And that Hiram of Biff was the actionable portion, the, the in-between, if you will, the balance point, uh, set forth to uh, spread light. And then he struck down by these outpourings, by these representations of ignorance, fanaticism, and tolerance. And he's knocked down and he's laid out, uh, you know, literally almost on the temple floor in this most sacred of places um, after being challenged. And this representation of our integrity is wiped away. And then these Elu, these men who have been laboring to be set apart, who have been trying to fill the voids left by their master in, in various ways, are again elevated and set apart. Uh, as representations of those free expressions. Of course, when we look at Hiram, we can see him as the symbol of a free thinker, of that apostle of liberty, uh, apostle of free thought, uh, that has you know, stood against those things that have tried to hamper us. Because the enemy of thinkers uh, who have endorsed the freedom of civil, political, religious authority uh, has been the despotic priesthood, has been the despotic government. Um, and, and of course, we can thus kind of tie this all back to that idea that Hiram as a representative of the divine word reminds us of free thought, free speech, free conscience is all what he stands for. And he symbolizes it as the apostle of liberty, equality, and brotherhood. And in that, we see a unique set of symbols, a unique dichotomy of understanding. The Elu, the assassins, the master, they all link together and follow unique and engaging trains of thought, however you want to take them. And we can rip each one apart and consider it. But in their various pieces, we see glimmers that as we reflect, as we contemplate, as you you watch another, the next Master Mason degree or another degree, you'll walk away and say, wow, okay, maybe that's something new I need to consider. Each of us were elected. Each of us were called to the bar, if you will, as Masons and set apart. And we are each Elu. We have each been elected uh, to the service of our obligations, to the service of humanity and our craft just as Hiram Abiff was, and of course, was struck down. Struck down by these representations of vices and superfluities. Struck down by these things that fetter men's minds, societies, governments, peoples. And if we have awareness of these things, if we have awareness of them, we see that Freemasonry moves us forward under the fatherhood of God as a brotherhood of men in the service of our fellow men fighting those vices, fighting those things like despotism, you know, mis misspent and corrupt government, uh, the mob mentality. Um, all of those things come together just by a simple awareness of the parts. And I think that's kind of something key to get to. Um, I apologize if this presentation seems a little disjointed in a couple spots. As I, I mentioned earlier to Brother Ron, uh, this is generally speaking a, a about another 30 minutes present longer. Uh, and we do it in a lodge usually. So there's a little bit more interaction and discussion on a couple things uh, that we just can't really jump to here tonight. Uh, but I appreciate your attention uh, and the time you've given me and I'll turn the floor back over to brother Ron. Thank you.